It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. Let the road trip begin. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Ooh, hit the roof then. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Pump yourself up with antiques. The aim, to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. That's a top job, isn't it? There'll be worthy winners. £400. Fantastic. And valiant losers. I'm screaming on the inside. Will it be the high road to glory? The gloves are off. Or the slow road to disaster? The gearbox is gone. This is the Antiques Road Trip. <laughs> Cookaburra. Welcome back to Wiltshire and the continuing saga of antiques adventurers James Braxton and Natasha Raskin Shah. <laughs> what was that noise? I think that was our undercarriage. <laughs> and it's got nothing to do with the fact that I'm sitting on this side. Nothing at all. I will not have that slur put against me. Wouldn't dream of it. But like the 1970 Porsche 911, our pair's progress so far could best be described as scraping along. We really need to bring this back, don't we? We need to, we turn need it to bring around. it back. And quickly. Goodness me. <laughs> Last time, James opted for items with a few condition issues. There is the criminal. His very soul has been taken away. Natasha went for an eclectic mix. There we go. Which included a fair amount of seating. I cannot believe I bought another chair. At the auction, James's busted bits went down well. Fifty pounds, thank you for that bit. <laughs> but Natasha's foray into furniture was a bit of a flop. These two are selling for twenty. I feel a verse coming on. Auction three, oh, best forgotten. Though in the antiques world, all's fair. But I'll tell you now, hell will see snow before I purchase another chair. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if she had heeded those words last time, Natasha's initial £200 budget wouldn't currently look like £94.52. pence. Yikes! James is faring a little better. After starting with the same amount, he now has £160.72p. But three auctions in, it might be time for a bit of a rethink. Well, we're not doing so well as antique dealers. What do you think we should have done with our lives, James? What should uh, we have been? I, I don't think people generally, unless you go into a profession, I think it's more likely that you have a portfolio career, isn't it? So our time in antiques is only temporary, is it? On our performance, it's probably <laughs> shorter than we think. I think we need to go speak to the careers advisor. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to stick at it and try harder. Our journey thus has taken in Devon, Somerset and now Wiltshire. It'll continue eastwards, ending up in Oxford. On this run-out, we tick off a few more counties as we shop towards Eversley in Hampshire. But our tale today begins in Melksham. Birthplace of Henry Moole, inventor of the dry earth closet, a forerunner to the Flushing Loo, and it's where our man Braxton has actually been let loose on his own. His first shop is Two Little Ducks at number 22, naturally. An eclectic mix of antiques and collectibles, just the thing for the man who likes a rummage. Just keep walking around and around and around, and it's amazing how something new will pop out. I need something to pop out. Nothing so far, but give it time, eh? My word, look at that fellow. The educational poster. That's striking a pose, isn't it? What is it? It's straight down there. I can feel the sinews tightening. And up here, do you know, he must be a forebear. The pose comes very naturally. Oh. oh. <laughs> well, he said something would pop out. Dear, oh dear, I think I pulled something. So, while he unkinks, let's catch up with Natasha. Currently heading to the market town of Royal Wooten Bassett. Her first shop is Old Bank Antiques, in an old bank, obviously. And uh, look, Natasha, look at all the lovely things you simply can't afford. Claris cliff plates, they're staying put. A Fabergé egg, not a chance. And that doesn't look cheap either. This is an original painting by Eugène Boudin. Get away, French Impressionist. 1824 to 98, the beach at Trouville was one of his favourite subjects. 
It's stunning. It's exactly what you want from a Buddha. I'm a little bit blown away. I have 94 pounds in my budget. You might want to add a few zeros <laughs> to this. Not worth quite a million pounds, but not far off. If only you'd done better at the auctions, eh? Back up in Melksham, how's the search going? It's quite amusing, isn't it? Dog cocking its leg. It's novel, I'll give you that. I think that's got age. I think that's 19th century American. It's got rubbed legs. It's made of cast iron. It's quite simply manufactured because it's moulded and then just screwed. It's of a, a Scotty, isn't it? Scotty dog. And I must say, I've never seen one before. Can't say I've ever looked, mate. 20 pounds on that. I like that. I like that, and I'm probably going to buy that. Well, no time like the present. Anne's in charge today. Anne found this rather strange cocking dog. He is cute. Do you know much about Mr Cocking Dog? Um, I believe it's a doorstop. It's got the weight, hasn't it? It has, yeah. We've got 20 quid on it, Anne. Would you take five of No. What about ten? I have to think about that one for a moment. Um... Oh, what, why you think? I'm just going to get the, get the <laughs> cash out. Um... Let's help you. Because it's you, yeah, you can have it for That's the really kind. There we are. I'll leave the tenor there. Thank you very much. And I'll bid you farewell. Good Thanks luck. a lot. Bye. Very generous, Anne. Just over £150 left. Now, back to the bank, where Natasha might be on to something too. I'm always attracted to a planter. Can't deny it. I live in a household with over 40 houseplants, so I'm always attracted to a planter. It's a Dutch style. I think that at this size, you really need a little bit of extra flounce and providing that, some paw feet and the lion mask handles with these rings. So I think it has appeal. It has age, it's probably about 150 years old or so. The whole point is, is that it's not the most expensive thing in this shop. But at 58 pounds, it's still more than half your budget. You know what I have to do? And I can't really deal with it. Look at that. Big gulp. Genuinely makes me nervous. I have to just go in hard with an offer. I think it's going to begin with a two. Wish me luck. You can do it, Natasha. John's the man you'll need to strong arm. John, hi. Hi. <laughs> I've seen a little planter that I like. So I have very little money to spend in your fine shop. What I'd like to spend on it is £20. Right. Is that possible? How about if we nudge you up to £25? Of course, £25 is a cracking discount. Thank you so much. That wasn't so hard, was it? Just under £70 left in your account. Thanks so much. Right, here it is. I'm off. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Thanks, John. Yes, time you made a withdrawal. Meanwhile, James has left the shops for now in search of a rural idyll. And surprisingly, he's come to the busy Wiltshire town of Swindon to find it. This is the old house at Cote, the childhood home of a prolific but largely forgotten author whose ideas about the natural world are particularly relevant today. James is meeting Mike Pringle, the director of the museum here. Hello. Hello, James. Who lived in this lovely thatch farmhouse? Uh, this was the birthplace and home of uh, Richard Jeffries, a nature writer from Victorian times. Born in 1848 to farming parents, Richard grew up in what was, at that time, rural Wiltshire. But it was a family tragedy that really spurred his love of nature. When he was a toddler, his elder sister, when she was five, she was killed by a horse out on the road. But the impact that had on the parents, of course, was very, very severe. And I think Jeffries was left a bit to his own devices. Um, and luckily for us, I think that's probably what led him to just go off wandering in the countryside yes. and start to develop this passion for nature uh, and the world around him. What was his education? Surely, as a writer, he would have been educated. Although he lived here in sort of rustic Wiltshire, he also spent a lot of time with his very well-to-do aunt near London. She gave him a very, very solid education, so he had this constant mix between society, uh, countryside, uh, oh, you know, well-to-do, 
So he got his skills from the town and his material from the countryside. Very good, yes. That, 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 I think really? that sums it up nicely. This education inspired him to pick up a pen, and he would spend hours writing here in this attic room. His first job, age 17, was at a local newspaper. Then he began writing articles for The Times. And although his subject matter was rural life, he up sticks from Wiltshire and moved closer to the capital. Strangely, the further away he moved from Swindon, the more he started to reminisce back to his days uh, here in the countryside. And, and partly because, of course, the things that was bringing him success were those tales of his country life. So, rather like Jane Austen or, or Beatrix Prosser, was there a breakthrough book? There was the gamekeeper at home. He shadowed a local gamekeeper and he poured out lots of fantastic stories and that became a bestseller. Many more books followed, all with the overarching theme of nature and mankind's effect upon it. From autobiographical works to what is thought to be the first post-apocalyptic science fiction novel. But perhaps his best love work was a tale of children's adventure. He wrote a book called Bevis, yeah. the story of a boy, and that's all about adventures out on the lake. And he wrote this almost simultaneously as Mark Twain was writing about Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer on the other side of the Atlantic. How um, interesting. So, he, you know, Jeffries was sort of doing the same thing over here. Slightly swallows an Amazon film? Or? Well, it's interesting you should mention that, because Arthur Ransom actually wrote Swano Swallows and Amazons because he'd read Bevis as a child. Ah. So it inspired him too. Sadly, Jeffries' life was cut short. He contracted tuberculosis and his health deteriorated. He became too ill to write, dictating his final works to his wife from his sickbed. Jeffries died in 1887 at the age of 38. His books, once bestsellers, gradually fell out of print and were all but forgotten. But the relevance today of his themes of ecology and conservation mean he's being rediscovered by a new generation of readers. We're sitting under the mulberry tree. He called this the tree of life and described how he spent his childhood playing under it and then falling in love and ultimately death itself. That's the story of everything that Jeffries wrote about. It was all about the natural world and the cycle of everything. Yeah. In a way, what he was writing back then uh, was sort of an early uh, attempt at what we would now call ecology. This is what Jeffries was essentially sort of pulling together for us and saying, look, guys, this is our planet, we're part of it. It's not a different thing. No. It's not something else, something other, and it's up to us to actually yeah. make it work for yeah. us. A man with ideas ahead of his time. Now, out and about in all that nature, someone's feeling less than tranquil. I know that the dealers are expecting us to haggle. I know that. It's just not in my nature. So I'm going to have to keep haggling like this, and I don't like it. Well, the best way to conquer your fears is to face them. So let's head off to Hungerford and do it all again. In 1688, during the Glorious Revolution, William of Orange was offered the crown of England in the local pub. Definitely beats bar snacks. <laughs> Hungerford. Here I come. Time to stiffen the sinews, gird the loins, and dive straight in. You've got this, girl. This is absolutely toka. There are just so many antiques. That's what we're here for. Home to over 100 dealers, it's a biggie. So there's bound to be something for your remaining £69.52 to spend on. Now, where to begin? All the way to the back. It's the only way to do this, methodically. Sounds good to me. This couldn't be anything other than pool pottery. Pool England, OK, good. Pick. Pool, great. <laughs> Didn't make a fool of myself. A Delphus vase, OK, from the Delphus range, painted by Rosina St Clair, 1971 to 1973. OK, so I would prefer for it to be larger. If it's bigger, I can't afford it. If it were orange, I don't think that I could afford it. And I would probably prefer for it to be a 60s piece of pool. That would be the more collectible stuff. 
That's still very cool, though. Huh, and only £18. I think sometimes you have to have faith in something that is instantly recognisable. And let's face it, pretty cheap. I wouldn't even have to be too cheeky when haggling on this one. Which is good. Let's see what else you can find. Oh. Half price, delightful. Love it. Love a bit of half price. Half price means less haggling again. This really stands out. Are you kidding? For the cat person who has everything, an enamel cat bracelet. Looks tiny. I have a humongous wrist. I'll confess to you, I have... I'm going to call it a butcher's wrist, OK? <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, it's just too small. Could that be for a child? A bit of enamelled silver? Hopefully, yeah, silver. Yes. Ah, a couple of good things going on in the back. Mika. Sterling. Denmark. I think that's mid-20th century, you know? I think we're talking 50s, 60s. Ticketed at £89. Even with the half-price discount, that's still a fair chunk of your money. I just think I have to be bold. I just think I have to do it. Claw away at that price tag. Mm. You'll need to talk to Adrian, one of the dealers. Let's hope he's a pussycat. <laughs> oh, Adrian. <laughs> you are waiting in the wings. I love I it. And I have amassed a very disparate eclectic collection. A Scandinavian bracelet formed of little cat's heads oh, in enamel. Yes. So cute. You know it? I do. Now, it's in the half-price cabinet. It's marked up at £89, so right now we're at £44.50. I'm wondering if you have the authority to go any lower than that. I think we could probably do that for £20. That's amazing. I would be daft not to say thank you so much at £20. Then there's a bit of pool pottery. Early 70s, Delphus Faz. Do you know the one? Do you know the oh, dealer? I think I do. You're looking at him right now. Oh, you're the dealer. Well, you're a lucky day. Oh, no, maybe it's not your lucky day. Or maybe day, not though. my lucky day. <laughs> it's marked up at 18. Would you take 10? How about £10? Would you do it for £10? I'll do it for £10. Uh, yes, please. That's fine. Pleasure. Thank Absolute you pleasure. so much. She might hate the haggle, but she's getting rather good at it. Just under £40 left. Uh, how long was I in there? It's past James's bedtime, that's for sure. Nighty night. Up and at em, road trippers, for another day of adventure. Good and Morgan. Good and Morgan. <laughs> And someone went for the continental breakfast. We have cross county lines. I know that we're all over the place. I've never known so many counties are joining each other. I confess I am confused, but I have it on good authority that we're in Berkshire. Hey, gold star in geography to that girl. Ah. And while traversing this and the other counties yesterday, there was a spot of shopping in which James only managed to procure one item. Dog cocking its leg. It's quite amusing, isn't it? That only cost a tenner, so he still has 150 smackers to play with. Natasha's day was more fruitful. She's got just under £40 left after picking up a copper planter and a very yellow vase. Tick. Pool. Great. <laughs> and one other item that she's brought along to share. Check out my little Scandinavian silver pussycat brooch. It's a bracelet, Natasha. Isn't that lovely? And it fits your wrist all right? We're all dealt a hand in life. And I've been dealt some seriously chubby wrists. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't decide if it's for a child or just for the lady's slighter of wrists. For your cat, I'll raise you a dog. What did you buy? I think it's in the footwell somewhere there. <laughs> Are you serious? Why did you buy this? Is it a, a doorstop? It's a doorstop. I just thought it was funny. And look at it from underneath. That is dark. That, it's like that a is wing. very improper. Allow the poor dog some decency. That's terrible. Don't mince your words, Natasha, eh? Later, Fido and all the other items will be swanning off to Stroud for auction. But today, we begin here in Berkshire at Newbury. Town motto? Fleurit Floriat, which means may it flourish as it has flourished. It's also the little prayer our experts say before every road trip. Mr Braxton is going solo this morning at the Newbury Emporium. 
And they're not short of stock in here. Oh, cabinets galore and more besides. Plenty for our man to get his mitts on. Well, that's an unusual piece. It's a fabulous little miniature long case clock. And it's made out of a spelter, which is a sort of lead-based alloy. You've got all this sort of stylized floral stuff, arabesque, and then you've got this barley twist here. Incredible decoration. You know, if you wanted something Victorian, this is it. The only minus is the dear battery-operated movement at the back. Not the original, then. <laughs> Anyone else getting deja vu? I did quite well in the uh, last auction with, uh, with that rather nice um, arts and crafts clock. Uh, that, funny enough, had a quartz movement. Maybe it's an omen. But the dial's right, the hands are right. And the price could be right. £35 on that. So that's a definite candidate. No messing about today, oh no. What else can you find? Look at this. Hey. Look at this. Think on your knees, James. Here's something that's quite sort of trendy. I always like combination of materials, and we've got here a jade coloured bracelet with gold coloured mounts, you know, and you hope that that is jade, and you hope that the mounts are actually gold. And it's got a hidden catch, and I think that's probably it. We've got a little marker, and there, it opens quite nicely. It's probably bought in somewhere like Hong Kong. It's got a sort of very stylized bamboo-like decoration, Chinese decoration, and the materials are very Chinese, aren't they, jade? No price on that, but it's right up his street. Um, that's like a giraffe. Oh. All, all the elegance of a gazelle. It's a comparison that's often been made, James. Anything else? And that is a very nice, rather fun object, isn't it? I think it's the toucan. I think that's crystal. And I think his body is crystal. And I think his tail is crystal. And I'm just going to quickly look at his eyes. Yeah, the little gem set cabochon eyes a little redstone there. Yeah, I don't see why that isn't crystal. If you were a bird person, you'd love that, wouldn't you? Well, I think that's great. I think that's a really lovely object. And even lovelier is the price, £15. You'd be hard-pressed to buy a couple of ready meals for 15 quid. It's been a rich seam here in Newbury. Indeed. Let's find Gary, the owner, to see if there's a deal to be done. Gary, I've had a lovely time. I've found a rather nice toucan, a bracelet, and a long case clock. And looking at them, I think it comes down to price. The miniature long case clock is 35. What could that be? That'd be a 30. 30. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with the birds, the toucan, 15, and the bracelet. Could you do that at 30? I was thinking 35, but as today, we'll do it at 30. I'm going to take the clock the bracelet and the toucan, 75 quid. Yep. Thank you, it's been easy. It shows with that little haul, and he still has over 75 pounds left. Thank you, the road's to riches. And you just make sure you look both ways before you cross, eh, James? Now, Newbury, of course, is a big horse racing town, having its own race course but it's to another of Berkshire's racehorse rendezvous, Lambourne, that Natasha is headed. For nearly 300 years, this village has played a big part in the sport of kings. Nowadays, it's the place to train for elite equines, but it used to host some of the earliest horse races. Up on the man-down gallops, Natasha's meeting historian Penny Stokes to find out how it all began. Take us back to the 18th century. Paint us a picture of a racehorse meeting here at Lambourne. The first recorded races that we know about were, I think, 1731. It was all amateur in those days, and in fact, the riders were usually the owners. So they tended to be portly country gentlemen <laughs> and squires. Oh, yeah. So it, it was very, very different. I mean, the horses were not today's thoroughbreds. They were smaller, very much sturdier. And they had to have much more endurance power because the races were run as a series of three-mile heats until one horse had won twice. So a horse might run for 12 miles. These races were the brainchild of William the Third Baron Craven. He owned all this land and, indeed, quite a lot of Berkshire. 
He sponsored the first meetings and, for the next 150 years, the Craven family continued to play a big role in the races here. That is until the first Earl of Craven, also named William, had other ideas. Lord Craven decided to set up racing in Newbury instead, so that really rather finished Lambourne as a regular place for racing. Racing, meanwhile, had become much more professional because of the Jockey Club, which started to insist on minimum prizes, minimum standards of courses and so on. Um, and that, ten that meant the little country race courses dotted around here and there, they just weren't viable any longer. This standardisation of the sport meant bad news for Lambourne. That is, until the 1840s, when the gallops at the home of horse racing Newmarket were hit by a severe drought, making the ground too hard for the horses to train on. So the owners and trainers were looking around and saying, where have they got some decent turf? And they found Lambourne. Um, and Lambourne has never really looked back since. Were any big names, big winners trained here? Berkshire's first Derby winner, Wild Durrell, winner of the Derby in 1855, was trained at Lambourne, but not by a professional. He was co-owned by Lord Craven, of course. The second Earl this time, and yet another William. And rather than employ a professional trainer, the horse was trained by a groom, a chap by the name of Rickaby. Wild Durrell um, went to Epsom and won the derby by two lengths. And the jockey club was, of course, absolutely appalled because, I mean, that wasn't supposed to happen with amateur, amateur horses. <laughs> Since then, hundreds of race winners have come out of Lambourne. It's been estimated that nowadays horse racing accounts for one in three of the jobs in the local economy. Natasha's meeting Will Riggle, the operations manager here, to see just some of the 700 thoroughbreds who train here. That was fast, but that wasn't top speed, was it? Uh, that would have been about 85, 90%, I think. They're keeping some of their powder dry? Uh, yes, two days out of seven, they'll do what we call working, which is um, close to full speed. And then the, the rest of the days, they're just doing routine canters, routine exercises. And it's all a bit more scientific than in Lord Craven's day. We have about 10 miles of, of grass gallops here, which are the preferred surface for, for galloping a horses on. But when the grass isn't up to scratch, it might be too firm because of a lack of rain or it might be too soft. We use these artificial gallops. That's not turf? No. Nope. So hold on. Oh, actually, as soon as I bent down, you can see feels when you start to move it around, it gets a little bit stuck together. Yeah, it's, it's wax coated and it's designed to ride the same every day of the week, give or take rain, shine or whatever the weather. And the welfare of the animals themselves has also improved. What happens to the horses after they stop racing? Racing's governing bodies are working very hard to, to ensure the, the welfare of our equine athletes from the minute they enter the sport to the moment that they leave the sport, and they're well looked after, so the owners will often uh, take their horses back off the trainers and look after them on their own stud farms. Obviously, the horses have a certain lifespan, but it seems that Lambourne just goes on and on and on. Do you foresee centuries to come here at these grounds. As long as there are race courses in Britain, there'll be horses trained in Lambourne. It's very proud of its racing heritage, and racing itself is very proud of Lambourne, yeah. And it's no wonder that this whole area has been dubbed the Valley of the Racehorse. And out and about, in his own thoroughbred, James is in a chipper mood. I got £75 cash in my pocket. I feel no pressure to spend all the money. I'm in a position where I can just put a little aside for a rainy day. Blimey. Well, that's a first on this trip. He's hoofed it into Hampshire, heading to Eversley and his last shop. Eversley Barn Antiques is the place. Oh, they are good. And a lovely place it is too. Let's have a rundown of what's on offer, James. Lots of cabinets, lots of copper, lots of Staffordshire, silver. It's an antique place. Well, it is an antique shop, one that you won't have to yourself for long, it seems. Of course he's already here. I really am always one step behind. I wouldn't worry. Nothing much has happened so far. Look at that. Lovely, lovely roll to the green, if I might say so. 
Is uh, this how it feels to be so relaxed and streets ahead with all that profit that you're just playing tabletop? Oh, just through. Crocky. Work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, doesn't it? Come on, let's play. Right, here we go. Oh, oh. no! <laughs> OK, I'm going to do a mallet drop. Mallet drop. And I'm going to say, enjoy yourself. I need to get serious. I need to find antiques. Don't worry, I will find your ball. Keep looking. And while he's distracted, you get first dibs at the goodies. What can you find for your remaining £39.52? pence? That's quite cool. Is that Rembrandt's The Night Watch? It is! I love that. Look at this. On either side of this letter rack. That is Rembrandt's most famous painting. Indeed it is. The Dutch master's largest work of art measuring 14 feet across now hangs in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. It's valued at slightly more than the £50 price tag on Natasha's version. <laughs> so here we have some continental silver marks, import marks, I think. 19th century. It's very light. The auction is so much about the gauge of metal, and there's not a lot of it. But what about the art historians out there? They need this. They need this Dutch silver letter rack that celebrates Rembrandt's finest work. I wouldn't want to pay too much for it, but that truly appeals. I love that. I think she's keen. Meanwhile, James is having a natter with the lady in charge, Judy. Look at that chair. It's a lovely chair, isn't it? Good wide seat, isn't it? Yeah. This is for a person who sat on a horse most of their life. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, doesn't the it? The spreading bottom. Yeah. OK. And that is lovely. It's very comfy. It's a very comfortable chair. I eat my lunch at that chair every do day. Do you? Yes, I do. It's a nice seat, but, you know, my heart, really, yeah. Judy, is with the bamboo. Yeah. He's a big fan, you know. Rather grand hall stand there. I've been beating the drum for 20 years on telly about bamboo. I know. I've had to listen to you bang on about it. I like this sort of crescent moon mirror. Yeah. And the sticks down there. It's missing its drip tray. Yeah, it's a bit... Bit wibbly-wobbly. Bit wibbly-wobbly. And how old do you think that is, James? Yeah, I think it's probably Victorian. Yeah. It's sort of very Oriental, Japanesey. So, Judy, what could this be bought for? For clearance, 20 quid. 20 quid, I will buy it at 20 quid. You've got a good buy there. I've got myself a deal. Fabulous. James, stop smiling. <laughs> He's very excited. £20 paid, 55 left for rainy day money. And I will send my man to collect it. Fabulous. Thank you Judy, very much. Judy, thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Goodbye. Bye-bye. One happy bunny. How's the other one getting along? A bit of Worcester, which I normally wouldn't be able to afford. So... Let's take a closer look. Yes, let's. Instantly, I have spotted on the label AF, so we know that's as found. So there's damage somewhere. I haven't found... Oh, is that it there? There is a hairline crack that is living up to its name. <laughs> Absolutely tiny, but I think, importantly, not interfering with the decoration. This rural hillside scene of some rams grazing on the mountain's edge. Very evocative. The palette is absolutely what you want it to be for Worcester. £20 is the price on that. Signed as well, look. So we have a 1913 E. Baxter original painting on this Worcester cabinet saucer. A shame it's not the cup. Where the two together, I wouldn't be able to afford it. I'm still going to haggle for it. That's what I came here to do, right? Have a haggle. She's warming to it now. Good your loins, Judy. Judy, hi. Hi. How are you? Very well, thank you. Are you braced? Yes. So, let's start with the bit I can see right now. It is a little Dutch silver letter oh, stand yeah, cute. over there. And the little Worcester saucer, £70 for the two. Would you be open to an offer that didn't even start with a four? <gasps> Would you take £10 for the saucer? OK. £25 for the silver, £35 in total. What do you think? No, that's fine. That should give you a, a chance of a profit. Very generous of you. Thank you so much. 
Yep, very kind, Judy. And that £35 deal means Natasha still has a tiny bit left too. Just under a fiver. Now, how was that for you? We've done it, James. We've done it. It is what it is. It was what it was. And... And it will be what it will be. And all winners? Of, of course. Of course. Well, we'll soon find out at the auction. After some shut-eye. Nighty-night. All aboard. We're getting up ahead of steam for our pair's penultimate auction. I hope they've got their tickets. Let's hope we get an upgrade. Oh, hey? my goodness. Oh, you look like smart a enough. A cheeky weekend upgrade. Oh, I think we can do better than that. I think this is a royal carriage. Are you sure we're allowed on here? Of course we are. Our auction spotters have disembarked at the railway centre at Didcot, but their goodies have taken the onward journey down the Golden Valley line to Stroud in Gloucestershire, pulling into Stroud auction rooms with bidders poised in the room, on the phones and online too. We're selling to the net at 45. James spent £105 on five auction lots, but does today's gavelmeister Stuart Moore fancy the chances of any of them? The Toucan, really nice decorative piece. It's set with little stones for the eyes, which is a nice touch, and nicely mounted on that boulder. It'll be a very popular item. Natasha's five lots were bought for a mere £90. Let's have your thoughts, Stuart. The Danish enamel bracelet, really popular. Danish jewellery, huge collector's market for it. Not too fussy, not over the top, understated. And that seems to be popular in the jewellery market at the moment. Right, time for some online auction action. All first class, hopefully. This is incredible. This is lovely. Oh, I feel like part of the royal family. But it's so comfortable, isn't it? It's so comfortable. This is our fourth auction. You're doing so much better than I am. Yeah, but But not... we are both below £200. We're hemorrhaging money. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a feeling in my waters if this could be your auction. Let's find out, eh? Starting with Natasha's kitty cat bracelet, definitely not a brooch. This is a profit. I must say, that's quite <laughs> gung-ho. <laughs> and £48 opens the bidding. Two oh! bids at £48. Pounds. 48 you were dead right. At £50 to IC5. Yay! At £50 to IC5. £50 to the broad done. 50 Wow! Well, that's a better start than we're used to. <sighs> Relief. You're back in the room, Natasha. Back in Back in the carriage. <laughs> <laughs> Can we keep it going with James's doggy doorstop? It's a wee one. There's something generally wholesome about that, isn't there? <laughs> something you can relate to. <laughs> 30 pounds opens the bidding. Oh, 30, 30 pounds. Bid for the Scotty dog. 32, 35, <laughs> 38, and 40's with me. 42's on the net. 42 pounds in the bids on the net. 42. Well done. Another good profit. Fido looks relieved. <laughs> £42 for a little dog having a pee. That is, yeah, uh... peeing dog. Well, that's the future, isn't it? <laughs> I'll be giving my ass pee. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Natasha's copper planter. She haggled hard for this. £30 starts the bidding. Oh, it started. £30, £32, £35. £38's with me. £38's still on commission with me. £40 then we're selling to the net. £42, £45. Oh, £45, oh. £28. I love this guy. <laughs> I love it. We needed an auctioneer like this. Forty-five. Seems to be going rather well so far, doesn't it? That's a wee profit. Well done. Winners all the way. Let's see if two can play at this game. Huh. See what I did there? And interest rate in at £70. 70 pounds. Seventy pounds. Seven zero. Seventy-five. Eighty. Eighty-five. Ninety. Keep going. Three figures. At ninety-five pounds. The ornithologists swooped in on that one. I think jammy comes into it, doesn't it? You beast! What do they say in Scotland, a wee jammy? I don't think they do. It's Natasha's bit of Worcester now, her cutlass saucer. Does it have a hairline crack? It does. Where? Just underneath the signature. Interest straight in at £60. Pounds. Oh 65 and 70. Oh, five, wow! Eight, five, 100, 110. <laughs> it's on commission with me at 110 pounds. Do you know, I'm starting to think that these two actually know what they're doing. <laughs> I cannot believe that. That's a big profit. 
Time for James's tiny long case clock. Let's see if the free battery can swing it for him again. And interest rate in at £32. Oh. All close bids at 32 32 do I see 5 At £32, then it's on commission. At £32, if we're all done. At £32. Still not a loss, but not what we've gotten used to. Oh. OK. Oh. Oh. Profit's a profit. Profit is a profit. Natasha's Night Watch letter rack. Next, slightly smaller than the original. Not by the hand of Rembrandt, but a follower. And £55 opens the bidding. £55 is on commission. Do I see sixth anywhere? God, I'm getting worried. Sixth. Don't you worry. £55 and the bid's on commission with me. Do I see Go on, sixth? put it down. <laughs> no! Keep going. And at 55 Someone is now the proud owner of a Dutch master. Wow, Rembrandt, my favourite artist. <laughs> Bracelet number two now, James's Jade one. Interest straight in at £60. Oh. £60 pounds starts the bidding 65 At 65 Go on, 70. get a rhythm. £65, pounds, do I see 70 anyway? 70 bid on the net now. Ooh. £70, pounds, do I see five? We're selling to the net at £70. Pounds. Well, that was worth knackering your knees for. Solid. Solid. £70. Pounds. It's not bad, is it? Natasha's final lot now, not big. Not orange, but definitely pool. £42 is bid. 42 do I see five? At 42, 45. I think my lead is now. being threatened. The bid's on the net at 45 do I see eight? That's great. £45 and we're selling to the net at 45. Hey, a clean sweep of profits for her. That's more like it. You could have bought that for two. Dear, oh dear. Well, Come you on, Ned. Have on ten? Of course I would. Who are you? Mr. Nasty. <laughs> Well, let's see if Mr Nasty can also make it five for five. His bargain bamboo hall stand is last under the hammer. Oh, they gifted this to you. In fact, I'm, I'm slightly regretting not haggling over this now. <laughs> Interest rate in at £120. £120 starts the bidding. Do I see 130 anywhere? Come on. Yeah. Oh, I want to scrap. Me, do I see 130? Come on. Come on. £120, and if we're all done. At £120. Hey, Bamboo Braxton is back, baby. What an auction, eh? Forget the tea. I think it's straight to a bottle of champagne, don't you? Yes. Yes, I love that. It was rather good. Natasha started out on this leg with just under £95. But after auction costs, she's back from the brink. She now is sitting on a much healthier £254.62. Nice. Nice. But James, who began with £160, made more. After sale room fees, he now has £350.10. And, and for the first time on this trip, they're both in the black. Lovely light now, isn't it? I know, it's the magic hour. And we magicked up so much money. I'm so proud of us, you know. What should we spend it on? More, more antiques. antiques.